Welcome Research Director and Founder, Sands Institute, Alan Pella. Good morning. Welcome to my favorite session of the year. This is the session where you all get a chance to meet the people I go to whenever the press calls and says, what's really happening? Um, the three people that are the go-to people. You're going to meet first Ed Scotus, who many of you know is the top penetration testing person in the country, but um, Ed is doing much more. I'll tell you about it in a second. You're also going to meet Heather Mahalik, who's the top person that I know in, in personal attacks, in web, uh, in, in mobile phone attacks, in finding out what's going on, and you're, you're going to meet again, we've been doing this for 13 years, um, uh, Johannes Ulrich, who runs the Internet Storm Center. So with them out here, Johannes, you're here. Um, there is a fourth person on the panel, not I, and that is maybe a slide. Uh, and that is you. It, this is, if you've come to these in any of the prior years, please do sit down. Um, if you come to this in any of the prior years, you know we took questions. So we're still taking questions. You send the questions to q at sands.org. You say which speaker you want to answer. Don't say the panel. I got a big team taking questions and, and sending them to me. And we have the same system we always use, which is if you get a question asked, you get a Dove chocolate but you have to go grab me after the session because we're not going to do it in this room. But you do, we have the Dove chocolates for you if you ask questions. So I'm going to sit down, introduce all three of the speakers, and then let them go. The, the format here is that they'll each have eight minutes, and you'll have the rest of the session to ask questions and get fast answers to the questions. It's really fun to ask them questions. Um, Ed, as I said, you know, is the person who created the pen testing programs at, at SANS. He's taught close to 30,000 people how to do uh, uh, red teaming and, and offensive security. Heather is the go-to person on attacks on mobile devices, mobile phones, um, and, and uh, the personal attacks. And Johannes runs this big thing called the Internet Storm Center where 30 people around the world are looking at every new attack last night and giving you briefings in the morning. 30,000 of you look at it every morning. Um, so it's, I know some of you know about it. Um, with that as the introduction, I'm going to start with Ed Scotus. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate your kind introduction. I'd like to get things started by talking about two specific attack vectors that I'm seeing increasingly in the cases that I'm working on, and we're also using this, these techniques in our penetration testing and in our red teaming activities. The first of the two is manipulation of the domain name system infrastructure associated with specific enterprises. We've seen this attack significantly impact organizations over the last several months. What's happening here is attackers are using credentials, usernames and passwords, or usernames and hashes that they have compromised in the normal course of business. Bad guys have compromised roughly a bajillion credentials so far. I, I give you some mathematical precision there. It's been about a bajillion. It's hundreds of millions, perhaps a billion or more accounts. They're taking these usernames and passwords, and the bad guys are using them to log into DNS providers as well as name registrars, and they're manipulating the DNS records there so that your enterprise DNS points not necessarily to your own infrastructure. In fact, what they're doing is they're manipulating the MX record so that email destined for your organization is actually being redirected to the bad guy's mail servers so they can intercept the email that way. They're going further. They're also applying for TLS certificates, and they're using certificate authorities that will allow you to apply and verify that you own a domain if you simply can respond to emails and click on links that are sent to the email for your given domain. So the bad guys will apply for a certificate at a place like Komodo or Let's Encrypt or some other similar place. The email goes from the certificate authority to your enterprise, which of course is now flowing through the bad guy's mail server. They will click on the link saying, yes, I own this domain because they own the domain, and then get a certificate issued. And that certificate will live for quite a long time. There's been some tremendous reporting about this series of attacks against various government agencies, against law enforcement entities, as well as some commercial organizations. Great reporting here by Cisco's Talos division. They, in fact, called this specific attack DN Espionage, which I think is a fantastic name for it. FireEye and CrowdStrike have some great blogs and write-ups about this. And as always, Brian Krebs has reported on this brilliantly. 
But how can you defend yourself against this stuff? For DNS defenses, the first thing is absolutely critical. Multi-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, at least, for whenever you're making changes to your DNS infrastructure. It's absolutely vital. Whether you control the infrastructure yourself or whether you have a third party that's controlling it, your administrators need to have two-factor authentication. Next, we need to deploy DNSSEC vigorously. Many organizations have done this, some have not. If you do deploy DNSSEC, remember that you need to have both signed DNS records as well as validation for those. If you deploy just half of this, you have not deployed DNSSEC. Thirdly, if you are a victim of this attack, your organization, your enterprise, you need to revoke any bad certificates that were issued right away. And I encourage you to make sure that you have your <coughs> operations personnel monitoring for any changes publicly associated with your DNS records or any digital certificates associated with your organization. There are some free services that you can rely on for this. There's an organization called Security Trails that you can get a free service where you can submit a request via an API to look for any changes associated with DNS in your particular domain. You could script this up so that you run it, say, once a day. You get 50 free queries per month, so once a day, you'll be in great shape. Also, for certificate checking, there's an organization called CRT.sh as well as Entrust that will allow you to submit queries on a free basis and see if there's any changes for publicly available certificates associated with your domain. That's the first of the two attack vectors I'd like to describe. For the second attack vector, I'd like to open it up by discussing domain fronting and seeing how that's going to lift the attackers fully into the cloud. Domain fronting is a technique used by attackers to obscure where the attacker is located, where the command and control is coming from, and where the bad guy is exfiltrating data to. Now, some people think this is really hard to implement, domain fronting. It sounds really impressive and important. It is really easy to implement this. There are plentiful tutorials online for implementing domain fronting. Some people think this is fixed. About a year ago, both Amazon and Google limited domain fronting for their content delivery networks. So a lot of people have said, well, this problem has gone away. It has not. In fact, there's other content delivery networks for which domain fronting works perfectly well today. It's a very useful technique for the attackers, and here's how it works. On the left-hand side, we have a compromised system. That's where the malware is. The bad guy would like to be able to get command and control over that malware, as well as exfiltrate data without the target organization knowing where the data is going from. The bad guy's attacker origin server is on the far right. The way this starts is the compromised machine with the malware on it will send a DNS request for some trusted website, a trusted website that is hosted on a content delivery network where the attacker is also a customer. So the attacker sets up some accounts on that specific content delivery network as well. The compromised system will then set up a TLS connection that is going to a trusted site on that same content delivery network. It's just a good site, a fine site. Then the malware will issue an HTTP 1.1 request with a host header asking for something other than that trusted site. It's actually asking for the attacker site, but it's inside the TLS connection, so the network defenders can't see what's inside there. It's all encrypted. The front end for the CDN sends the request to the web server's instance that the attacker controls on the content delivery network, which then forwards that request into the attacker's origin server. In this way, the attacker has built a reliable command and control, as well as data exfiltration channel. And as far as the defending network is concerned, this is going to a trusted site on a content delivery network. This is a problem. But this is just scratching the surface. You see, domain fronting has shown the attackers that, hey, we can disappear into the cloud. Even if we waved our hands and got rid of all domain fronting today, the bad guys now know that they can host things on cloud-based services and still undermine many organizations. In fact, organizations that are using cloud-based services will often trust the cloud provider that they're using as though it was part of their own infrastructure. And you know why they do that? because the cloud provider is part of their own infrastructure, effectively, right? So bad guys are taking advantage of this. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't one cloud, when it sees nefarious activity, just shut down that activity from wherever it's coming? And the bad guys know this. So what they're doing is they're laundering their connections through multiple different clouds, hopping from cloud to cloud to cloud. And the chances that one cloud provider is going to filter out an entire other cloud provider 
are very small. They don't want to deny service. So the attackers are disappearing into the fog of the clouds. So how do you defend against this? First, if you're in an enterprise, enterprise TLS interception can go a long way to help you. There's a wonderful guide for doing this. It's from the National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands. It's really, really well done. You also need to consider that your cloud provider may be compromised and build that into the scenarios that you're working with. Also, encrypt data that you store on the cloud, but don't put the encryption keys for that on the same cloud. And finally, to detect the domain fronting malware and other kinds of nefarious beacon activity, there's a great tool called RITA. It stands for Real Intelligence Threat Analytics. It's from Black Hills Information Security. It's a fantastic free tool, and you should check it out. I'd like to turn things over to Heather Mahalik. Be before you do, I've oh, got yes. two, two things. I want the, the questioning system is working. I, I've got one for you, and oh, great. I, I will give it to you in a second. I also wanted to mention that Ed has a new passion which might touch some of you, so when you catch him, when you see him, you might talk to him about it. It turns out that in the military and in a lot of large organizations, cybersecurity isn't done individually. It's done in teams. And there doesn't seem to be any team preparation, like Special Forces team preparation in the field. And about a year ago, he took this on, and we're just beginning to see the results in the military. It looks like there, you can actually make teams, special, sort of special mission teams in cybersecurity that do better. So that's it. And, and I left one thing out on, on Heather as well. I just, re somebody reminded me, I just um, heard this week that she is the poster girl for the uh, program that 26 governors announced. Most of you have probably heard about it. It's called Girls Go Cyber Start, where they're doing a talent search across the whole country for young women. If you have kids in high school or in college, um, it's just look up Girls Go Cyber Start, but you'll, you'll see profiles of Heather. But let me ask this first question that came in. Sure. Uh, Ed, if command and control isn't beaconing at regular or frequent intervals, what other aspects of the communication can be used for differentiating malicious from benign traffic? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. So, so the idea is we can measure whether something's beaconing very regularly, like every five seconds or every minute or something like that. But what if it's not, right? And if it's not, there's other attributes of the, the malware traffic that we can look for. We can look for uh, long-term connections. Uh, a, a TLS connection or a TCP connection should not last this long. We could also look for things going to a bunch of different domain names that are outside of your normal DNS resolution. We can look for unusual traffic sizes. And the cool thing is this Rita tool, the free tool I mentioned, it actually can do analysis across all those different all those things. Yep, yep. Cool. Do you want to... Heather? Heather? Heather Mahalik. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> For the last 17 years, I've done digital forensics, which really gives me interesting perspective when it comes to security. It's essentially frontline, if you think about it. I get to see how people are getting into things. When I started doing my research for this talk, I actually had to take a step back and see how publicly available some of my stuff actually was. Recently, I was working an investigation where a woman was very concerned and thought someone was tracking her. And this always comes up. People think people are watching them, and most of the time we just kind of pawn it off, like you're not that special, no one's watching you. But in this case, it was happening. The attacker knew where she was going to be, knew every conversation she was having in secret chat messages, almost appeared to be on the next device as soon as she got it. So how this was happening, targeted cloud individualized attacks. Ed was just talking about enterprise level, and I want to take a big step back from that. Think about personal attacks. If someone wants to get your information, how easy is it for them to get it? They are going to know where you are, not only where you are, but where you may intend to go, because it's tracked in cloud. There's all these predictions on traffic and things to help us. The lazier we get as humans, the better the glimpse into our life is for everyone else. And that's scary. So what was happening in this attack is you really just can't shake it. Once they infiltrate one cloud, can they just keep hopping to your other information? And that is exactly what is going to happen. How they get in is there are so many ways. And here are just some examples. It's as simple as your username and password, but how do they get it? Do you have maybe Android malware where it prompted you to enter your Gmail address and your password, and they were able to just keep hopping from that point. 
Um, maybe it was an Apple Fairplay attack on your iPhone. Everyone assumes you're safe on iPhone, and you're not. These attacks can happen anywhere. So how are they actually getting in? But then I want you to think about all the things you put out there into the world. So how many people know your birthday because of Facebook? How many people know your nickname because your friend tweeted, like, good luck, Hank? And I'm like, OK, now my birthday is there. My nickname is there. People tag you in posts. They talk about your pets, your kids. All of this stuff can be used against you. When we look at weak access controls, what is required if someone guesses incorrectly five times? You would hope they're locked out. But it's not always that hard. I had a student once hack one of my challenge questions because he was able to find the suspect's birthday on Facebook. That's not good. If you can reset a passcode with someone's birthday, chances are most of you could reset my passcodes today. You could get on Facebook, look for someone wishing me a happy birthday, and take it from there. So you have to be really careful with this. Lack of two-factor authentication is just poor, poor security at this point. It should be offered. And if it's not, you should reconsider using that application or cloud service. You have to have a way to protect yourself. To mitigate this, I'm going to use Google as an example. Um, Google is one of the primary providers that most of us in this room probably use something associated to Google. So you should be concerned, is it good or not? When I worked that last investigation and I realized that her Google cloud data is what was being hacked, I actually took a good glimpse of my own. I went to myactivity.google.com. It's simple. Log in, and Google will guide you through the proper settings. They are going to tell you, if you have location history turned on, what it's tracking and why. They want to help us be lazy humans. They want to tell us, hey, traffic's bad. Go this way instead. But if you're using it, what else is leveraging it? So then you go to your security checkup. And at the bottom, it says third-party access. Those are your third-party apps that have access to this information. If you don't like it, turn it off. Disable it. I cannot stress enough to make sure you are doing security checkups on yourself. If you provide devices to employees, maybe you have a reminder that everybody has to do a security checkup every so often. I honestly don't do it enough. I should do it more than what I have, but it's really important. We can see there there was a new sign-on from an Apple iPod or iPad and a Linux workstation in Tokyo, Japan. If this is not you, you should be highly concerned. In addition to this, Google sends me an email anytime there's a weird logon or a new logon to Chrome. That is very helpful. If you are willing to take the steps to look at what is accessible and do proper settings, the solid cloud providers will protect you. You just have to read it and implement it and actually do it. Now, I love this graphic here because this is exactly what we all do. We have mobile devices, and we broadcast everything about our personal lives into the world. We are all targets. The biggest mistake you can make is assuming that people don't care about your data. And I am guilty of this. I have joked on so many webcasts that if someone hacks me, or if the government's listening to me, they're going to hear about potty training and puppies. No one cares about that, but they do. Because think about what else you'll get if you hack me. You could get my financial information. You could get my spouse's information. You could get on Mantech systems. Like, there are so many things that you may think you're uninteresting, but you're not. People will get into your systems if they want to. Don't give too much away. So a good example of social engineering that I guarantee all of us at some point have at least read it. Maybe you didn't fill it out. Think about social media. You choose Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I don't care. And there's a quiz that says, what's your hacker handle? And we're like, all right, that sounds pretty cool. I want to know my hacker handle. So I go in, it says, what's your middle name? I enter it. What's the name of your first pet? I enter it. And it's like, congratulations, Nicole Gizmo. You are now a hacker. And then I post it. And I'm like, Nicole Gizmo. And you're like, wonder what that is. So then you do it. And you're like, Heather, Nicole, her first pet is Gizmo. How many people realize that your bank, your bank, one of the first questions, what's the first name or what was your first pet? You enter Gizmo, you can reset a password. That's bad. Don't worry, I've changed mine. Gizmo was my first pet. <laughs> I was a big Gremlins fan. It is no longer Gizmo. 
I wouldn't have given that example. But the point is, we have to be conscious of what we put out there. I hope you're not targeted, but if you are, you have to think about how did they get in. It's probably you're putting it all out into the world. Use two-factor authentication. Review your settings. Consider what you give permissions to. And set really strong passwords. If you're not capable of doing that, use a password manager that will do it for you, and then make sure that password is really secure. Bottom line, the threat is real. It is personalized. The responsibility is 100% on us. Johannes? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is Johannes Ulrich. OK. It's Name's up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, now, I want to start out with a protocol that uh, Ed already discussed, but I want to talk about it from a different perspective. And you know, going back to DNS, one of the hard problems in security is always the balance between some security and privacy, in particular if we're talking about network monitoring. And when I teach about network monitoring, the one thing I always say is, hey, if you want to get started easy, one of the protocols, one of the type of logs where you get the biggest bang for the buck is DNS logs, because everything you do, everything malicious happening on your network sort of leaves a trace in a DNS. Now, just talking quickly about sort of the DNS infrastructure here, when I want to go to a website, I first connect to my recursive name server that's run by my company, uh, by my ISP, and that does all the work, goes to the authoritative name servers that have all the answers. Now, from a privacy point of view, the real dangerous connection is sort of the one between you and your recursive name server, because if a bad guy is able to actually intercept that traffic, well, uh, they learn a lot about your traffic, what you're doing, what website you're going to. But on the other hand, for a defender, that's also where you want to sit. Because if there's malware on the system, well, um, you learn about the malware because it does connect the DNS to resolve that malicious host name. And actually, one of the most useful reports that I was like with DNS is show me all outbound connections where I don't have a DNS resolution first, because that's actually often malicious too. So uh, these are great indicators that we have. But what about the privacy part? People are able to see everything I'm doing. That's what DNS is about if they get access to that traffic. So people came up with a nice protocol, and it starts to show up, for example, in Firefox, DNS over HTTPS. So what's so great about it from a privacy point of view well, now everything you do happens over HTTPS. And we like HTTPS. We learned it's a great thing to have to protect the content of our web browsing. But now it also protects that metadata, which sites we go to. On the other hand, for me as a defender doing network monitoring, I'm now losing one of the most important tools that I have to actually spot evil stuff on my network. So what can we do about it? Well, uh, I think we really have to think about two use cases here. We do have enterprise networks. Enterprise networks' number one problem is actually securing customer data. If you're working for an enterprise, which websites you visit, well, that shouldn't really be sort of that privacy shouldn't really be a priority. If you do want to do some private browsing, use your cell phone, do it on your own time, but not in enterprise network. On the other hand, if you're traveling to a conference, uh, if you're traveling to a foreign country, or even if you don't trust your ISP back home, um, DNS over TLS gives you sort of that, or DNS over HTTPS gives you that poor man's VPN. Is it as good as a real VPN? No, it's not. Uh, but it's close, and it helps. Uh, so if you can use a real VPN, you still have to trust the endpoints. Whoever runs that recursive DNS server that you're using, they still get all the data. You're really just protecting sort of that last mile. So that's really what it's about, and you have to find the right balance here. The other thread I want to talk about is sort of a continuation of what we talked about last year. Last year, I talked about, well, hardware flaws, CPU flaws. And boy, you know, last year was really sort of the CPU flaw year. Uh, I think just uh, last week, there was yet another Spectre. Anybody still tracking how many Spectre vulnerabilities there are out there? Uh, there? There are like a bunch of them that people sort of discovered, not sure how different they are from each other. So let's move away from the CPU. Your system is not just a CPU. It's a bunch of other chips as well. 
And many of them are systems in their own right. So they have processing power, they have memory, they have code running in them. And I want to start out here not talking about flaws in these products, but really just how an attacker can take advantage of the feature. So you have your attacker. Your attacker got a hold of one of your servers, got root on it. So what can they do next? They can actually use these systems against you, like these famous baseboard management controllers. They can use them to get more persistent access to a system. Last time you sort of rendered a server out in the cloud, did you check if the baseboard management controller was actually still in its original state? Or if someone actually modified it, a prior user of that system? But more than that, if you architected your network right, then these baseboard management controllers, they're often used to reboot systems and uh, power off, power on. They should be connected to a management network. An attacker that controls that baseboard management controller now has access to that management network. And they can use that. Often people assume that this management network, well, the reason we implement it is air gapped. Hmm? Uh, nobody can connect to it from the outside. Well, they can connect through the server. And often, well, we leave the tools to do it just right on the server. All these little management tools allow us to change passwords, flash firmware on the BMC. They're often still on the system. So all of these different components, they need to be secured. Some of them, of course, have vulnerabilities. Like, for example, recently, uh, these Marvel chipset vulnerabilities uh, in, in Wi-Fi network cards. And it's, again, one of those things. We, anybody heard of Marvel as a chipset manufacturer for Wi-Fi cards? Probably not. I have to admit, I didn't hear until I heard about the vulnerability. But it turns out, well, Microsoft puts uh, these uh, chipsets in uh, their notebooks. So if you have one of the Microsoft Surface uh, notebooks, then you probably have one of those chipsets in there. Uh, other vulnerabilities that don't really seem to go away are, for example, Thunderbolt and all these ports that give direct memory access. Lots of stuff has been developed to protect them, but not all operating systems necessarily use these techniques properly. So what can you do to prevent it? Well, uh, other people that may have been born before the uh, Unix epoch uh, may remember things like dial-up modems. That was our prior sort of out-of-band management that we had. And we had similar problems there, where often these back doors, these official back doors we had for out-of-band management weren't really properly protected and monitored. Anybody remembers war dialing? So that was a big deal back then. We really have to think back and remember that all of these management networks we set up, nothing is air-gapped. So we have to apply the same kind of network monitoring that we use on our external facing networks to these management networks. And it's actually easier in some ways because you have less traffic on those networks if things go well. So it shouldn't really be that hard to monitor who is logging in into what system using this management network. And don't just rely on logging built into these baseball management controllers because, well, that's what the attacker may have access to and that's what may be compromised. So really some passive network monitoring is really important for these management networks. And with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Alan. Oh, we, we have enough questions for this session and the virtual session, but keep them coming because you're raising the bar on your questions. Um, Heather, how can an average user find out what the cloud providers have on them? Oh, it's pretty simple. If you're using iCloud, log into your iCloud, pull your data down. Your credentials are needed. If you're using Google or any other service, same thing. Pull your data, take a look. If you don't like it, change your settings. Cool. Johannes, virtual systems and Docker containers. They usually don't have access to the baseboard management controllers and that kind of hardware. So am I safe from those attacks if I switch to virtualization? Correct. Uh, if an attacker gets access to a virtual system, they typically don't have access to these hardware components. But if they get access to the host the virtual system is running in, then again, they have access. And of course, with virtual machines and Docker, there would be a whole other story, all the vulnerabilities that come with those ecosystems uh, that are somewhat similar. So like recently, we had the big Docker vulnerability. If someone uses that, uh, they have similar access to all the different containers. Cool. Ed, uh, I got one for you, but if you want to add something to his answer, go ahead. Is there, is there any way to know when a cloud provider has actually been compromised, uh, or are we at the mercy of their compromised disclosure? 
Well, kind of both. Um, so compromise disclosure is an important thing from cloud providers, and you should have a discussion with your cloud provider before you sign on with them as an enterprise um, what their disclosure process is, uh, what their alerting process is. But additionally, you should be monitoring the assets that you have inside the cloud. Now, some of the cloud providers provide uh, capabilities, functionality, so you can kind of see attacks and such against your infrastructure there. In fact, on last year's panel, I covered some of those uh, capabilities in uh, Microsoft Azure, in uh, Google Cloud, as well as uh, Amazon Web Services. But additionally, you can instrument systems within the cloud itself. Don't think the cloud provider is going to do everything for you. Putting things like IDS and IPS within the cloud itself is a useful thing. Don't just depend on the cloud to protect you. You can, you can up the bar, up the ante. Cool. Heather, um, oh, you, th I think I'll do this one. You, um, you, this was to me. You said Heather was the model for the new governor's national talent search. I have a daughter in college. Is there a way for her to find out if she has a talent for this? Um, there is a, if you go to Girls Go Cyber Start, just, just Google it, you'll see the 26 states where it's, it, it's uh, available. It's almost all the sort of cyber states except New York. Don't know why, but anyway. Um, but so Girls Go Cyber Start, and the other is called Cyber Fast Track. So Cyber Fast Track is a college program that girl, the governor's announced. Girls Go Cyber Start, and it's not just for girls. If the girls do well enough, they win the, the access to the system for all the boys in high school. So the girls are the lead instead of the boys are the lead, but the boys get there too. Okay, Heather, a real question for you. Apart from our phones and their respective accounts, where else is location tracked, and how do they, how do they track us? Everywhere. <laughs> Honestly, it's everywhere. It's in our cars, it's in our watches, Fitbits, um, your tablets, your PC, your Mac. It is absolutely everywhere. And most people don't even realize it's turned on on a simple desktop computer because you're not really taking it with you mobily. But it's there. It's there. Johannes, on this HTTPS stuff, I can use the server name indicator to figure out which site a user is visiting. Does this also work to identify DNS over HTTPS? So uh, the server name indicator is a field in the client hello when you establish a TLS connection that tells you the host name uh, you're connecting to. For uh, DNS over HTTPS, you would see the host name of the endpoint that the user connects to. But actually, in the latest, greatest version of TLS, TLS 1.3, they're starting to encrypt that server name indicator field as well. So that's going away slowly. Cool. Um, Ed, haven't Google and Amazon implemented changes that block domain fronting using their services? You alluded to that. Yes. Can yeah. you go a little deeper? So, so about a year ago, um, Amazon and Google implemented a change. So they're actually looking at the, the, uh, the SNI that uh, Johannes just referred to. And then they're looking at the host header that follows to see if it's consistent. Are they the same system? Did you just make a TLS connection? And now are you asking for content from that same website? And if you're not, block it. And a lot of people say, well, that, that stops domain fronting. It limits it within Google and Amazon, that's true. But there are other content delivery networks through which you can do domain fronting. And uh, so that problem hasn't gone away. And even if everybody blocked it, um, the bad guys can still set up their own servers in the cloud and not do domain fronting, but instead just pivot through the cloud itself. Cool. I think cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, Heather, how can organizations, organizations reduce their risk from attacks that are personal attacks on their employees, their employees get hacked, and then they use that as a stepping off point to get back into the enterprise. What's the best thing for an enterprise to do? Yeah, it definitely happens. Um, hire security conscious people. <laughs> no, that's a joke, but you should. Um, you have to implement rules. There has to be some form of standard if people can connect to your networks. And I know people that I work with believe it's a breach of privacy, and it is. It's kind of like Big Brother is watching you but it's for the own good of the company. So there are pros and cons to each, but you have to have security implementations in place. You have to have rules on what they can and can't use, especially if they're connecting to your networks. And you should have a policy in place that if they find out they are hacked or compromised in any way, that they have to report it. Just, just when you do your, your cases, it feels like it, you often can find out where patient zero was, right? So you, if, if I'm the one who caused the system to get 
hacked because my PC or my phone got hacked, can you usually find out who I am? Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> and you, find and, but you, you and hunt you, hunt Alan. You, <laughs> hunt you down? Okay, just checking. Um, <laughs> uh, I just I did a second one for you, Heather. Let me do it. Uh, Johannes, we're using lights out management for our remote sites. We have a lot of them. We're using unique credentials at each location, and we have segmented networks. Are we good, or is there something else we should be doing to mitigate this issue? You're doing pretty good if you're going that far, in particular the unique credentials and such. But the one thing I mentioned that you definitely should do is still, is still monitor the network. Uh, like there has to be some logging enforcement component here because it's all too easy to mess up and not do it right or have a system there that's not properly configured or got to reset to default configurations. So that's uh, so the monitoring part that really has to be part of Absolutely it. Absolutely true. And, and we just finished a pen test uh, like a month ago where they did all that and it was very good. But some of the systems, just like Johanna said, were not configured according to the spec that the organization itself had. And we were able to find those, and their lights out management stuff was not authenticating using strong, unique passwords, and we were able to get in that way. So, so you, you got to do it right, but then you also have to check to make sure you're doing it right. Yep. And actually, I just want to follow up on the one thing you mentioned earlier with finding patients zero. I think uh, one thing you know, with dealing with employees and such, I mentioned the difference between an enterprise network and a home network, but also don't be too harsh on people that do click on the bad attachment. Uh, because the worst thing can happen is them not reporting it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the more you delay the response, the more dangerous it gets. So, uh, yes, you know, there should be some punishment maybe, but it uh, shouldn't be too severe to have them not report it. You know? Heather, you made a big point about two-factor authentication um, or the ability to review your... Sh many vendors don't support two-factor authentication. I've got one bank that does and one bank that doesn't. You're saying I should close the accounts in the bank that doesn't. Okay. Um, other policies intended to prevent the use of strong passwords. Is there somewhere you draw the line between security and convenience? They're trying to make it easy for people to use their services. So where's the hard line? Where's Heather's hard line? That's actually, this is something I just personally experienced last week. Um, my bank, I won't name the bank, took away the ability to add characters. So now you can just do numbers and letters, upper and lowercase, that's fine, but no wild card. So I had like some dollar signs and stuff. I was forced to reset that passcode but they implemented two-factor authentication instead. So this is where you just have to consider which do you think is stronger, which is going to protect you better, and now there's additional steps to a two-factor authentication. So you can add other methods to identify yourself and protect yourself. But honestly, from my personal perspective, I would not put anything that mattered to me in any type of storage container that I could not protect with a strong password or two-factor authentication. There's actually another uh, sort of upcoming standard, WebAuthN. The FIDO Alliance comes up with, came up with that. And uh, that's uh, starting to show up, like Google Chrome and such supports it now. Uh, it supports hardware authenticators uh, where you don't really have to remember passwords anymore. Uh, real nice standard, a little bit, uh, not enough time here to talk much about it. Uh, but look it up and uh, see if you can implement it if you are in charge of of a website. Yeah. And they could even do one-time temporary passwords. There are so many free, easy ways to implement it. Right. I think it's the lack of awareness on how important it is. And that's why people are just missing the mark. One of the things that almost everyone has had to sit through is a security awareness briefing where they said, make your password very long and hard to remember. And they did that because NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, had a policy statement out that that's the best way. If a teacher stands in front of you and says that, tell them to go back, because NIST changed their mind about, what, eight months ago? Yeah. And said, that is a really bad idea. We're really sorry. But a lot of the people who are teaching still have that slide, and they're still pushing you to do the thing that actually hurts you instead of the thing that actually helps you. There, there's a, a really simple thing that you could do also to make it harder to attack your passwords. Obviously, you really want to go with two-factor authentication. But even with that, simply putting a space in your password. Now, not all systems support that, but some do. But I'm telling you, as a computer attacker, putting a space in your password makes it harder for me to crack or guess your password. You could put it in the middle somewhere, maybe put a couple of spaces. The most insidious place for you to put a space in your password, though, is at the end. And you know why? 
Because if the attacker successfully cracks your password, it'll display on the attacker's screen, and they won't see the spaces, right? <laughs> so they'll go in, and they'll lock out your account, wondering why your password doesn't work, because they're not typing in the spaces. And I'd rather have my account locked out than the bad guy get access to it. Yeah. And on cool. that note, if your account is locked, you should be notified. Yes. <laughs> Things that aren't notifying you, that's unacceptable. There's there needs to be some form so you but, know what happened. But then you're going to call them, and that costs money. Uh, <laughs> Ed, let's go on. Back to, back. Ed, we keep hearing about living off the land. How do we detect when often used programs are doing something malicious? You want to define living off the land sure. first? And then so, so living off the land is a, is a technique that is used in uh, red teaming and penetration testing where the adversary, the attackers, the professional uh, hackers, are using the built-in features of the operating system and administration tools to hack into the target environment. In other words, you're living off the land. Uh, sometimes an attacker will hack into a system, and they'll install all of their tool set there. And that's, that's a very heavy footprint there that they might get detected. So instead, it's a more elegant way to hack a system by just getting into that machine and living off the land using what's already there it's harder to monitor because you're using the legitimate pieces of the operating system to undermine the environment itself. So what do you need to do? You need to really look carefully at the logs associated with administrator use. Look for things like unusual administrator accounts, unusual times of day, um, unusual activities for the given administrator account. Now that means you're going to need to understand what normal administrator activity is so you can look for the deltas. But that's the way you're going to catch live off the land style attacks. Cool. And that, that's a more sophisticated attacker right there. Cool. Uh, one more for each of you and then we'll, uh, we'll close it. Johannes, we use proxies to intercept HTTPS traffic and our clients trust our certificate authority. Can this be used to decode DNS over HTTPS? Uh, yes, it certainly can. I'm not 100% sure where all the different proxy manufacturers so are at that. But essentially what happens with DNS over HTTPS is that the DNS payload is just the body of the HTTPS request. Uh, there are a couple different ways to encode it, either just binary or JSON if you want to away waste some bytes. Uh, but um, yes, you, know, you can decode it as long as the browser trusts that proxy and a, that proxy can do a man in the middle. Cool. Heather, I'm going to ask you one you might not want to answer. But um, it says, uh, myactivity.google.com uh, shows a lot of data. Should we just stop using Gmail? No. <laughs> you, uh, people always say that. Stop using Gmail. Go back to Yahoo. <laughs> no. Um, we should not stop using Gmail. We just have to control the settings. You have to go in and do your security checks. And if you have location on, why do you have it on? Where do you have it on? It's just be responsible with it. Cool. I love Gmail. I couldn't live without it personally. Ed, last one, last of the questions, and I'm going to ask each of you just to give you an advance warning. Just one thought that the audience to leave with the audience for, for till next year, uh, or at least till our virtual session. Um, Ed, um, you say revoke bad certs. How can I detect bad certs to revoke? So um, there are various uh, sites. I cited a couple in the uh, presentation that will actually gather certificate information from uh, around the internet, around the world, and allow you to query that information based on your domain names. So what you can do is you can simply do a query of that, maybe daily have your operations team, look and see all of the certificates associated with each of your domains, and it's going to give you the changes. And just look for recent changes. If those are illegitimate changes, it's revocation time. It just plain is. So keep an eye on that. It's something that your normal operations folks should be doing systematically, at least weekly, but perhaps daily. Wonderful. OK, one last thought from Johannes, then Heather, then Ed. Well, uh, my big focus is always information sharing. I think the only way we can improve is by learning from, hopefully, others' mistakes. So. Uh, if you make mistakes, share them, let everybody know about them, and hope they don't make the same mistake again and they share their mistakes with you so you can actually learn from theirs. Thank you. Heather? That was good. Mm -hmm. um, I would focus on grooming and bringing up the next generation of people that are going to be us. Um, I am always asked to help girls in cyber, and I'm happy to, and I love doing that. I'm actually going out to Notre Dame this summer to work with girls in cybersecurity. It's myself, Sarah Edwards, and Jessica Hyde are doing presentations. But what I also think is important is every mentor I've had in my life has been a male. So I think it's great for males to groom females and females to groom males. Because at some point, a female will report to a male, 
and there are chances there are young boys out there who are reporting to us women. So we have to just mold each other, and it doesn't have to just be gender-based. And Great. last word? Sure. That yeah, would, give it to her. So, so last year, uh, I left my, uh, my final parting point um, saying to pay it forward. It's very similar to what Heather just said, but I'm also going to add some additional specifics too. So I challenged you all last year to say, hey, go and speak at your local high school or local community college. You are information security professionals. This is RSA conference. Some of the, the, the finest minds in this industry are represented here. And we need to bring up the next generation and teach them how to make a meaningful contribution to the information security space. So I reissue my challenge. Well, first of all, I ask you, did you do that last year? I asked you last year to do it. Heather just asked you now, did you do it? Some did. Yep. Um, if you didn't, shame on you. Uh, do it this year. <laughs> do it this year. Ser seriously, double down on that. And one of the things th that I do is I volunteer uh, to uh, support and help coach a cyber patriot team. You might want to do something like that. Um, or your local community colleges are always thirsty for interesting evening presentations. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a four-year uh, institution that you're nearby. Offer to do a presentation, something there, to just kind of pay it forward. And I think the best thing you can do is if you have technical skills, sit down at the keyboard with some of these students in high school, in, in community colleges, and show them some of the techniques that you apply in your job every single day. And then the special extra suggestion, have them work together as teams, because then they become sort of self-reinforcing cohorts. So you're showing this team of five or eight or 10 kids what you're doing every day, hands on keyboard, and then when you leave, hopefully they will kind of cohere together and still support each other. So I challenge you to do that. I'll check in on you next year to see how you did, okay? Thank you, let's thank the panel. Let's go. Thank you all too.